Okay, that's all there is to this. So next thing, so typically wires are gonna have a little bit of resistance and depending on the dimensions and the material the wires are made out of, that resistance is gonna vary a little bit. Now, basically your resistance is equal to this row here. Row is not representing density, but it's representing something intrinsic to a, your conductor. In this case, it's called resistivity. You can look those up in tables. And then it turns out the resistance is proportional to the length and inversely proportional to the area. So let's say that I ran out of gas and I decided that I'm gonna steal gas out of Joseph's car. So how am I gonna steal gas out of Joseph's car? I'm gonna pump it out, I'm gonna siphon it out. So how do I get that siphoning process started? I have to create a vacuum, I'm gonna do it with my mouth. I got nothing else handy here, so I'm gonna you know, suck on the end of the hose here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna get a hose that is a mile long, and I'm gonna wrap it around the building here a few times, and then hook it up to Joseph's car on one end, and then I'm gonna suck on the other end. Am I going to get any gasoline out that hose? No. The longer the hose, the more resistance to the flow of water, and it works the same way here. The longer the wire, the greater the resistance to the flow of electrons. Okay, let's try a shorter hose then. Now I'm gonna get a hose that's only like, let's just go 10 feet long, sound better? I got a better chance? Cool. The hose I'm gonna use though is like an IV drip hose, like the one type you'd see, you know, in somebody's arm from an IV. So super narrow hose. And I'm gonna suck on a 10 foot long segment of that, put the other end in your gas tank. Am I gonna get any gas something out of that? I don't think I'm gonna get it there either. That hose is just too small. So A here stands for the cross-sectional area of the hose, and a smaller cross-sectional area leads to a higher resistance as well. So here resistance is proportional to the length of the hose, but inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area of the hose. And again, that applies to water flow, but it also applies in this case specifically to the flow of electrons or at least imaginary positive charges in your wire. So if you wanna have the least resistance possible, what kind of wire should I use? shortest and biggest diameter so that I get a big cross-sectional area. That's what I want. And same thing for the flow of gasoline out of Joseph's gas tank. I want a hose with a very big diameter that's as short as I can possibly have it. And then I've got the greatest chance of getting the gasoline out of Joseph's gas tank. All right, cool. Uh, so this relationship you should intrinsically understand. You should know that, yeah, resistance is proportional length and inverse proportional area. Notice this is inversely proportional to the surface area, not the radius. So notice how does the radius, what do you suppose the typical shape of a wire? It's cylindrical and so the cross-sectional area is a circle. And so pi r squared is the area. So notice you should realize that the area is pi r squared, not just related to r, cool? So let's see how we can apply this in an example. On your second page, question number two. Question number two says, a piece of copper wire of resistance R. So here I've got a piece of copper wire and its resistance is simply equal to R. Cool, we're gonna replace this piece of copper wire with a new piece of copper wire, so it's still copper, that is half as long and has a radius that is three times larger. So it's only half as long as the original wire, but the diameter is now three times bigger and the question is, what would be the resistance in this wire? So, what did we do to the length? Decreased by a factor two. What would that, what would the effect on the resistance there? Okay, also decreased by a factor two, so half the resistance, okay. What did we do to the diameter here, or the radius? We tripled it. What does that do to the area? Good, it makes the area nine times bigger. And so in this case, if the area is nine times bigger, what does that do to the resistance? Makes it nine times smaller. So in this case, by cutting the length in half, that cut the resistance in half. So by cutting, or by tripling the radius, that increased the area, cross-sectional area by a factor of nine, and that reduced the resistance by a factor of nine. Factoring both of those in, what would be the value of the resistance in this wire if the old wire had a resistance of R? Not 1 11th, it's multiplicative. 1 half and 1 ninth gets you 1 18th R. So the resistance in this wire would be 1 18th R. Would you mind writing it? 
Yeah, we can totally do that. So let's say for the first wire, rho L over A gives you R, right? So for the second wire, we're gonna have the same row, that hasn't changed, it's still a copper wire, but what's the length? One half L, and what is the area? Nine times A. And so if we look at this and factor the constants out here, we're gonna get 1 18th rho times L over A. And what does that equal? Well, everything in parentheses here, we just said a second ago, that's how we got the resistance of R for the original wire. And so that's why the new wire here is gonna have a resistance of 1 18th, that value, 1 18th R. Okay. So let's talk about the temperature effects on resistance. So typically, anybody know, do metals get more conductive or less conductive as you raise the temperature? Less, less conductive. What about, and you guys don't really know this, but what about semiconductors? Do they get more conductive or less conductive as you raise the temperature? They actually get more. So, but metals in general get less conductive as you raise the temperature, and it's because the resistance goes up. We can see how that happens here. So, in this case, you've got the resistivity is equal to some resistivity at a temperature you know, times one plus, and this is the temperature resistivity coefficient here, times the change in temperature. So these temperature resistivity coefficients are typically positive for metals. And so as you get a positive delta T, i.e. the temperature is going up, you're gonna end up with a resistivity that ends up higher than the original resistivity at the original temperature you knew. Cool. And if you look, because resistance is proportional to the resistivity here, then the resistance works exactly the same way. So if you know some resistance at a given temperature, then you can find the resistance at a new temperature here, knowing both this temperature resistivity coefficient as well as your change in temperature. Cool. Cool. And it's a plug and, tug, plug and chug type situation. No, no big deal here. One thing you should know, though, so if, if the resistance goes up as they go to higher temperatures, what happens to the resistance as you go to lower temperatures? It would decrease, and that would just mean your delta T was negative in this case, which is why your end resistance would end up being lower than the original resistance. So for certain materials, though, you lower that temperature down, you lower that temperature down, you lower that temperature down, and the resistance keeps going down, and then all of a sudden, for certain materials, the resistance just takes a mad drop off, and it goes essentially almost all the way to exactly zero, like virtually zero. So what do we call these materials that have a resistance of zero? Superconductors. Superconductors. So, and these are handy dandy materials. You should realize they just have, you know, virtually a resistance of zero, but only at low temperatures. So, and even, you know, the, the original ones were all like below 10 Kelvin, which is not exactly helpful, right? So negative 263 degrees Celsius, get colder than that, and maybe you got a superconductor. But some of the later ones here, are up over 100 Kelvin, maybe even as high as 150 Kelvin, but is that still useful? Maybe on the coldest days in Antarctica, maybe that might end up being relevant, still maybe not, you know? So it's still pretty cold, but it, it gets closer to being something we might actually use and be helpful. So it turns out though, that even at those cold temperatures, they are helpful. So one of the NMR machines, nuclear magnetic resonance machines at ASU, they use a superconducting electromagnet. So they got coils and coils, miles and miles, it turns out, of superconducting wire that's super expensive so to create their electromagnet. Now notice, when's the only time these wires are gonna be superconducting though? When they're cold, how do they keep them so cold? Because it's in a room like this, how do they keep it cold? Well, so liquid nitrogen and liquid helium. They use liquid helium to keep it at around four Kelvin and then they use liquid nitrogen to keep the liquid helium cold as well. <laughs> So, but the idea is this, they plug this thing in and this thing runs on about a, a lightning bolt worth of electricity. So it's a lot of electricity, but they plug this thing in, it charges up and then they unplug it. And because there's no resistance, the potential never drops. It just stays at a high potential the entire time. It just keeps looping around the circuit, powering this electromagnet. So, and it, because it runs on a, you know, a lightning bolt worth of electricity, that would be expensive if it had to remain plugged in because it wasn't made of superconducting wire. So where's the expense then? If they're not paying for the electricity, they, they plugged it in a few years ago and it just keeps running. So then where's the expense? Yeah, paying for the liquid helium and liquid nitrogen. They pay, I think, somewhere around $60,000 a year to keep that thing running, but that's far less than they would expend on an electric bill to keep this thing running. So that's kind of the deal. 
Cool, but just general, know what a superconductor is, know that they only superconduct at this point in time at low temperatures, maybe somewhere down the road we'll figure out some higher temperature ones and it would be awesome. Uh, we've definitely, you know, they've got ideas of using like power lines somehow made of superconducting materials and I don't know exactly how they plan on keeping the power lines at low temperatures and stuff, but what would be the advantage of that? Well, if there's no resistance across the power lines, so there's a huge loss in energy as the electricity passes across the power lines and stuff like that. If there was no loss in energy though, that would be huge. So for the efficiency in our power lines, in our power grid. All right, uh, let's talk about the loss in energy through a resistor. So power loss in a resistor, P equals VI, or technically more properly, it's really delta VI. So, and this is gonna be the power dissipated through your resistor. So let's say your resistor is that tungsten filament. So what kind of energy is being given off at that tungsten filament in your light bulb, your old school light bulbs? Heat and, and light. That's where the energy is being dissipated. So and in this case, you can kind of get how that power is dissipated in this fashion. Now, if you recall with Ohm's law, delta V equals IR. If you substitute IR in for delta V here, what do you get as another expression for the power? I squared. I squared R. If instead you'd solved for I, what's I equal to? Good, we already said that one, delta V over R. If instead of substituting for delta V, you substitute in delta V over R for I, what do you get? V squared over R. Yeah. Cool. All of these are equivalent expressions for the power dissipated in a resistor. So notice you only have to know two things, either delta V and I, I and R, or delta V and R. If you know any two of those three about a resistor, so then you can figure out the power dissipated in that resistor. But they all should lead you to the same calculation. Can you plug in the resistance of the uh, row over length times area? In so uh, typically this is the, the power dissipated through a particular resistor. So what you'll find out is when we start dealing with circuits, we're just gonna pretend that there's no resistance in the wires themselves, that there are gonna be these little resistors we insert into the circuit, and that's where all the resistance is gonna be. So however, though, you could totally plug in the resistance of your wires, so into such an equation, and figure out, okay, how much you know, power is being dissipated just through the wires themselves? You could totally do that. So if you look again on your second page there, we look at question number three. Number three says, how much power is dissipated across a two ohm resistor having a current of three amps flowing through it? So the same resistor we had a little bit ago, same resistance, same current, but now we wanna know what power is being dissipated in that lovely resistor. Which of these versions of power dis dissipated do you wanna use? I like that one too, because we know I and R. Notice we could use I and R to find delta V and then use any one of these we want, but if you have two of them, just use those. So in this case, so what's our current again? Three amps. Three amps, and our resistance? Two ohms. And so what's the power dissipated through this resistor? Oop, let's not forget to square that. Awesome, 18 watts. Actually, I said it, 18 watts. Oh, <laughs> so the SI unit for power here is watts. So, and a watt is a joule per second. So amp squared times ohms. Amp squared times ohms happens to be a joule per second. <laughs> cool, but yeah, power here is measured in watts. So if you notice, and again, a watt, is power, if you recall, we learned a definition for power last semester. What was power last semester? Work over time, work over time. And notice work is joules and time is seconds and that's why your watt is your joule seconds. If you look, your energy bill at the end of the month, either by like APS or SRP, might show you how much electricity you use. But they don't tell you how much electricity you used in joules. What do they tell you how much electricity you used in? No, kilowatt hours. Well, kilowatt, I know what that is. What's a kilowatt hour? Well, if you notice, if watts equals joules times time, what would happen if you multiplied the watts by the time? What would that give you units of? Energy. 
So a watt second would be a joule. Well, in this case, they're using kilowatt hours instead, but it does have units of energy. Cool, and you could do a conversion into joules if you wanted to, but that's why they use kilowatt hours, just a convenient energy unit for their bills.